Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Zunino, and uh, welcome to my oral presentation of uh, Guided Zoom Questioning Network Evidence for Fine Grain Classification. This work is in collaboration between Boston University, IIT, and Adobe Research. Suppose a general case where you have a test image of a motorcycle. This image is passed inside a convolutional neural network trained for image classification, here called conventional CNN. In this case, uh, this image is incorrectly classified uh, with the class car. If you are picking only the top one predicted class, uh, you are limiting the powerness of the conventional CNN, which in this case has predicted as the second top class, uh, the correct class, uh, that is the motorcycle. We can say that in general, the top K classification accuracy of a convolutional neural network is usually significantly higher than the top one accuracy. This phenomena is also more evident in fine-grained datasets where differences between classes are quite subtle. If you consider the popular dataset of Stanford Dogs, you can easily obtain a top one accuracy of 86.9 compared to a top five accuracy of 98.9. You can notice the big gap between these two accuracies. In our work, <laughs> We want to use the image evidence used by the convolutional neural network to predict uh, specific class condition probabilities, and we want to use this image evidence to refine the classification provided by the conventional CNN. We will refine the classification between the top K predicted class. What is an image evidence? An image evidence is defined as the spatial cue in the image used by the convolutional neural network to predict uh, specific class condition probabilities. Uh, nowadays, in literature, there are present a lot of saliency methods which are able to generate saliency map associated with specific class condition probabilities. For example, uh, examples of saliency methods are uh, excitation backprop, gradcam, and rise, but other methods. Um, what are doing a saliency method? A saliency method is, is highlighting which are discriminative cues specific to specific class condition probabilities. You can see in this slide how a saliency method can highlight uh, and can generate a saliency map specific for the class car and a saliency map specific for the class motorcycle. In our work, we, use the, we will define as the evidence uh, the patch extracted from the peak of saliency of these saliency maps. In these slides, I have reported our pipeline, our guided zoom pipeline. Our pipeline is divided in two main modules. The first module is an evidence CNN module, and the second module will be a decision refinement module. What is an evidence CNN? An evidence CNN is a standard convolution neural network trained for the same classification task of the conventional CNN, but used as input not more the original images, but patches. These patches are collected in a, in a preliminary phase in training from the training images. Suppose that you are in testing, you, your, image, uh, your test image is passed inside the conventional CNN, the conventional CNN will predict uh, specific as conditional probabilities. In our work, we will focus uh, the attention on the first top K predicted class, in this case two, for example, so between the car and the motorcycle prediction. We will generate a saliency map for these two class uh, uh, predicted, and we will extract the evidence around uh, the peak of saliency for these saliency maps. We'll obtain something like displayed in the slides, where there is an evidence for the, the class car and an evidence for the class motorcycle. This evidence will be passed inside the evidence CNN module, that is a classification module. So it will classify independently these two images, and implicitly what will do the evidence CNN? Implicitly, it will compare the evidence of the car if, the, if this evidence is more coherent with the evidence pool of the of the patches extracted during training for the images of car, it is more coherent respect to the evidence pool of the motorcycle. And it will do the same for the, for the evidence of the motorcycle. So it is a classification module anyway, so it will classify independently these two images, and it will generate two additional class condition probabilities vectors that they will be combined in the residual refinement module together with the class condition probability vector generated with the conventional CNN. Finally, the refined class condition probability vector will be biased toward the correct class, and the refined top one priority class will be the correct one, in this case, motorcycle. Now, I will explain you how, how I will train the evidence CNN module. So, to extract the patches uh, over the images, I have used a popular method that is called excitation backprop, a work of Zhang et al. of 2018. 
You can see in these slides that I have reported patches extracted from training images of different data sets, for example, the data set of birds, the data set of dogs, and the data set of aircraft. You can notice, if you consider specific class of birds, for example, you can notice some consistency between the evidence extracted from specific class. For example, often the, the most important detail of the image is the red detail for the first class or the yellow detail of the second class. Another thing that you can notice is, for example, if you consider the dog's data set, the most evident part extracted by a, a saliency method could be often a, a face of the dog. What we thought was that to train in a more clever way our evidence CNN module, we could also have extracted more evidence around, around the object to improve our evidence CNN module. So what we thought was to extract additional evidence from the image. We were inspired by work of Wei et al., a work of 2017. This work was proposing an adversarial raising approach. What is an adversarial raising approach? So um, that work was uh, focusing on image, image segmentation, so on object segmentation in the image. Inspired by that work, what we, what we were doing? So we, we, we were passing all the training images inside the conventional CNN, we then generate a saliency map like the one that you see in the, the second column of the figure, and from that we, we could have extracted the first evidence of the, of the object in the image. Then, inspired by the method of Wei et al., we have covered this salient part on the image with a, with a box, and then repass all these images inside the network to force the network to find additional evidence important for the same object. Again, we have extracted the evidence around the peak of salience in these images, and again, we have covered the, uh, the, the salient part and pass again the image inside the network. We have done further and further this approach until the network was still able to correctly classify the image. In this way, we could have augmented our additional uh, data set on which our evidence CNN was trained on. So by doing this iterative adversarial raising, we have forced an implicit part localization since the network was forced to find additional evidence in the image. You can see in these slides that I have reported examples, in each row examples of uh, images of dogs of the class Chihuahua from the Stanford dog dataset. And you can see that in each column I have reported the evidence extracted with the approach adversarial raising. You can see that the first column is the first evidence extracted, the second, the, the second evidence, and so on. You can notice, again, some consistency between the evidence extracted in different images. You can see, for example, that the first evidence is often the face of the dogs, the second evidence are the ear of the dogs, and the third evidence are the legs of the dogs. All these patches, all these parts extracted, will be assigned to the same label of the original images. In this way, we have forced an implicit part label correlation during the training of our evidence in N module. So, our pipeline is, uh, um, first of all, we, we have then trained the evidence CNN for the same classification task of, of the conventional CNN using this pool of patches. Then, in testing, the evidence CNN is predicting, is classifying the test evidence extracted from the test images, and this class condition probability pre prediction will be combined with the conventional CNN prediction to refine the top one predicted class. So the decision refinement, uh, as I said, is, is simply a weighted combination between the conventional CNN prediction with the evidence CNN prediction. Here I have reported a practical example where you have a test image of uh, a class of bird that is yellow breasted chat. This image is, is passed inside the conventional CNN and in this case, the conventional CNN is incorrectly classified this image with the class yellow trotted vireo. So if you are picking only the top one predicted class, you are picking the incorrect class. But uh, between the top K predicted class, there is the correct one that is highlighted in blue, the yellow breasted chat. So what it is doing our, uh, our pipeline? Our pipeline will focus the attention on the top K predicted class, in this case three, and it will generate, a, it will extract an evidence for all the top K predicted class, for each top K predicted class. These details will be used by the evidence CNN, and the, what it is doing the evidence CNN? The evidence CNN will compare these details to all the evidence pool of each specific class. So our idea is that the detail will be more similar to the evidence pool extracted during training 
of the correct class respect to the evidence pool for the other top K predicted class. In this way, the prediction will be biased toward the correct class. We have conducted two types of experiments, uh, considering uh, the fine grained dataset of birds, uh, Stanford dogs, and FGVC aircraft dataset. In the first experiment, we have considered as the conventional CNN, uh, RSNet 101, and you can see that using our method, guided zoom, uh, we can get better improvement respect to the conventional CNN baseline uh, accuracy. As the second experiment, since our method was uh, very general, uh, you can think to consider as the conventional CNN uh, whatever architecture you, you think, and we have considered the MACNN architecture that was already providing very good results for the proposed datasets. This work is a work of 2017. So by using this network as a conventional CNN, we could also have extracted more powerful evidence, since our conventional CNN in this case was already more powerful than the ResNet 101. And again, also in this case, you can see uh, uh, that our method is improving the in, in accuracy respect to the conventional CNN accuracy. Our method in general obtain new state of the art for all the considered data sets. In conclusion, we, we were able to improve the top one classification accuracy and get state of the art result of, in a fine grained classification task. And this was obtained using a saliency approach in a weekly supervised way without any part annotation, any hierarchical label information, and any additional data. Thank you all for your attention. I will now glad to answer to all your questions. And uh, for additional details, uh, please come to my poster tomorrow, number 235. Thank you. Thank you for sticking your time as well. Um, we have time for two or three questions. Are you uh, the microphone ready? So one here. Do we have a second question ready? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, so, good talk. Uh, I wanted to understand uh, how will you handle scenarios where you're detecting a car, but there's also a sticker of a bird on the car. Now, if it classifies it as a car and a bird, both are right. But what you really want to feed uh, knowledge into the system, saying that the car is more important, or detect that. Uh, yeah. So, how would you handle that scenario? Would you? Can you repeat the scenario exactly? So, the scenario is when you have two objects in the same scene, but one of them does not have an effect. So if you take a self-driving car, if I have another car approaching me, or driving ahead of me, but has a sticker of a bird, of a bird. on it, right? Okay. So your CNN will tell you, I see a bird, I see a car as well, and it gives you the evidence for both of them. Uh, but uh, at that point of time, you don't want it to be wrongly classified as a bird as well, or? Uh, Actually, our work. Or did that, was that data set in your, I mean, was, was there any such data set in your, you, you've used? I think that's the question. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we have tested in datasets where uh, images. Ah, sorry. We have tested our method uh, considering dataset uh, which contain only one object per image. So, for sure, this I think answer to your question. Uh, in terms of uh, the difference of parameters. What is the uh, difference between the parameters of your model, your proposed model, and the uh, benchmarks that you have proposed? In terms of parameters? Huh? Yeah, like uh, how many parameters uh, do we have in addition? To but for sure, um, our pipeline only contains an additional convolution neural network, mm -hmm. that is the evidence CNN. This evidence CNN is a standard uh, neural network that classify patches instead of original images. So you can say that compared to very sophisticated methods which are uh, extracting patches before, our method is using only two networks, one conventional CNN, and our method is refining this classification using this additional neural network. So um, I have not a comparison between parameters, but let's say our method has two, two networks. Maybe other methods have more parameters in other uh, parts of the pipeline, 
So, but I have not the comparison between parameters. Okay, we have time for one more question. Perhaps to try one zero four. Do we have? Yeah. Do we have any question from one zero four? No, we don't. No. Okay. So. <laughs> So is your network sensitive, very nice talk, <clears throat> is your network sensitive to um, the ordering of the evidence? In the order? Yes, so in, a, in, in other words, you, you said it was the first level evidence was dog's face and the second sure. level evidence were ears. But what happens if you have objects or situations where perhaps the nest network response is, is not so clear, I mean, the order could change, or things the like that. The order should not be, I mean, our pipeline, I think, is not sensitive to this order, because anyway, during training, uh, I mean, you have assigned to all these patches the same label. So, the evidence CNN has, has, already, under, has already learned uh, that all these patches have, this, have the same label. So, in which, whatever order you will obtain the evidence, there will not be change in the in the so pipeline. There is no separate network for each evidence. No, no. Well. The same network will classify all the patches. Because during training, I have assigned to the same label all these patches. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Right, next we have um, Federico Lendi. So you're going to present the work on, again, on the um, convolutional neural network, look at the body vision language dynamics. So. Great. Hi. My name is Federico Landi, and in this talk, I'm proud to present my work with title Embodied Vision and Language Navigation with Dynamic Convolutional Filters. In the first part of this talk, I'm going to introduce and describe the task of visual language navigation, and then I'm going to explain how dynamic filters work and motivate their use and their effectiveness for this task. So, talking about navigation, good news is that we're all familiar with it. We're all familiar with visual and language navigation. Bad news is that it's not simple. For example, Try to give an example. Uh, when we are in a building we've never seen before and we need to reach a room, or if we need to get to the coffee break at the student union, we usually can count on an instruction that usually something like this, more complicated, uh, usually takes into account that we have to change floor, moving between rooms. And the most difficult part comes when we have to ground this instruction into our visual observation because we know where we start, but we really ask ourselves, how can we get to the goal safely? How can we progress towards the goal step by step without actually we are not able to hallucinate what we're going to see if the environment is unseen? So solving vision and language navigation implies finding an answer to this question. And it's a very young task. It was defined in CVPR 2018 by Anderson et al. i giving you some definitions here. Uh, we can see that the task takes into account the fact that both the instruction and the environments are unseen during train, so the agent must be able to generalize and uh, following the instruction from to, to go to a st from a starting location to a goal location. And of course, many other definitions will come with time, but I think we can all agree on the fact that we can further summarize the task in saying that the agent needs to know where to go and possibly how to get there. These two simple sentences also allow me to resume our two contributions. So given a 360 image of the surroundings, we want to ground different instruction. One instruction could be like sentence A or sentence B or basically anything else, taking into account objects, directions, colors, relative position between them. And yeah, there's a great variety into the sentences, so there are a lot of uh, variants. And the good news is that our method, that the method we propose, uses dynamic convolutional filters that address this kind of diversity in instruction. And I would say that dynamic filters are efficient because they plan and exploit the diversity in the instruction. We will see in the next slide what I mean with this. 
Once we know where we want to go, we need to get there. And as an additional contribution in our paper, we, we categorize previous work on visual language navigation and distinguish two categories. The first is the category of low-level action methods, and the second category is the one of high-level action methods. What really changes, what really makes a difference is their level of abstraction and their level, their action spaces. So the output, output spaces of the methods are different. So there is a low-level action space which simulates continuous control of the agent and action are like turning left or right, tilting up or down to adjust your elevation in order to go upstairs. And this action space it's closer to real world applications, and that's why we choose to stay here. But it's also challenging for a lot of reasons. And there is also the high level action space, which performs uh, path selection on a discrete graph. So I mean that uh, given that we are in the green node, we know what the adjacent nodes are, so we can just crop the part of the input image corresponding to these nodes, and then we can rank them basing accordingly to the instruction we have to follow. And once we have decided where we want to go, there is a teleport beam, sort of a teleport mechanism that takes us there, and the agent does not need to adjust headings or elevation before stepping. So that's why we basically believe that high level action space is a simplified setting, Maybe uh, that's why the high-level action methods usually achieve better results than low-level. And surprisingly, nobody had ever pointed this out before our work. Uh, a common approach to visual language navigation usually takes the image and instruction and creates two intermediate representation that corresponds to uh, points into very high-dimensional Latin spaces. Uh, but in this way, the policy is... Uh, really hard time trying to decode the next section because it's very hard to link the two points and the two high dimensional spaces. Instead, in our approach, we use dynamic convolutional filters to project the two representation in a merged latent space so that the policy can count on a very efficient representation and can decode the next action in a simpler way. Dynamic convolutional filters were first conceived for tracking by natural language instruction and in CVPR 2017, and were further explored uh, for actual and action segmentation from a sentence, and were proven to be very effective to merge visual representation and lingual instruction. We can create a dynamic kernel starting from uh, an instruction uh, representation STT and applying a multilayer perceptron followed by a nonlinear activation, we usually hyperbolic tangent in our experiments, and also uh, L2 normalization helps. We can easily see that this approach is parallelizable, so we can add multiple heads and create a set of filters to create a dynamic convolutional layer. Once we have obtained the filters, which are usually one by one filters, we only need an image feature map that we call IDT to perform dynamic convolution. In this way, we obtain dynamic feature maps, uh, and the number of feature maps, of course, equals the number of dynamic filters we have created in the previous step. So how can we embed this dynamic convolution into a VLN architecture? Well, it's very easy. We can just create an encoding for the sentence. We use GLOW and LSTM and then create a representation, a starting representation for the image, and we use a ResNet. So we have obtained SDT and IDT that we were showing in the previous slide, and we can create dynamic filters and perform dynamic convolution. In this way, we obtain a dynamic response map that we can feed to a policy and decode the next section. Our policy is a recurrent neural network in terms, and we also add an attention mechanism to attend to different parts of the instructions accordingly to the policy hidden state. All of our experiments are carried on on the room-to-room -room data set proposed by Anderson et al., uh, which builds upon multiple data set of spaces 
and comprises 90 different buildings and 7,000 navigation paths. Each path is described by three different instructions, and that makes about 21,000 descriptions. There are two different validation splits. So the first validation takes place in buildings that we have already seen during training, so the agent knows the environment, let's say, while the validation unseen splits only contains buildings that are totally new and unexplored. Then there is a test server with the public leaderboard, which is publicly accessible online. All the results are public. And all of the other instruction goes in train set. So the evaluation metrics are the navigation errors, so the mean distance between the agent final position and the goal, the success rate, which is the fraction of episodes terminated within a certain threshold from the goal, the Oracle success rate, which is greater or equals the success rate, and then it is the success rate that the agent would achieve if it received an Oracle stop signal along its trajectory. So in the closest point of its trajectory, it receives stops. And then the SPL, which is the success rate divided by the normalized path length, which means that we, if we have explored too much of the environment or if we haven't followed the instruction carefully, we are penalized. The first of our experiments want to test how many dynamic filters do we need to encode meaningful information? Is it true that the more dynamic feature maps we have, the better the results? I'll give you five seconds to answer. Surprise, we only need one filters and one dynamic feature maps to make things work well. And the best results are with four filters. So not the hundreds or thousands of filters we would need in traditional comnets. We show some qualitative results for this experiment. We have the image that we had in the previous slides with two different instructions. We see that the response map is coherent with instruction, and if we change the indication, then results change accordingly. In our regulation study, we explore the importance of each of our models, and we see that all of them are very important for the final results. But of course, dynamic convolution is the most valuable model as it provides, let's say, 10% of improvement on success rate. And then we have a comparison with the state of the art for low level action methods. As I've said, we separate the two categories as direct comparison would not be fair as we are acting on two different settings. And we see that we are the state of the art for low level vision and language navigation by a large margin and on all the metrics. We also, I would not say we compare, but we, make our, we take our results closer to high the, the results of high level action methods and we see that we are comparable, sometimes even better. That's a good news because we believe that high level action methods are, um, are in a most more favorable settings, but remember that direct comparison, direct comparison is not feasible. We also show some qualitative results and some navigation episodes from the room to room data set. We have the instruction on the left, and we see that the agent is able to walk down the stairs, turning right, and walk towards the bench. So this episode is successful, and this episode is successful too, although the sentence is quite long. And if somebody here is familiar with um, NLP, knows that NLSTM has a real hard time encoding all of that information. So I'm going to conclusion. Uh, we have seen, I think we can all agree on the fact that vision and language navigation is not simple, so our suggestion is do not add further complexity in the model because keeping it simple has proven to be very effective. We have seen that dynamic convolutional filters can act as specialized and flexible feature extractors. They can merge lingual description and visual representation efficiently. And we have seen that different action spaces dramatically influence the results on the room-to-room -room data set. So be aware of that when making comparison. Otherwise, your conclusion wouldn't be totally right. So thank you. Three.
Uh, thank you very fascinating talk. Uh, would you say that uh, the weakest point of this very nice solution, is it the linguistic path um, that uses LSTM to encode the instruction, or is it the vision part that finds the stuff that you need to find? What's your feel? I think there's a lot to gain uh, on the instruction part, on the encoding part, because as I said, uh, NLSTM is a real hard time encoding a sentence that is more than 30 or 40 words. I mean, there is an instruction that is more than 100 words, so there's a lot of gain to get there. Any questions from this room? Uh, do we have a question from room 104? Does anyone have any questions? Uh, no, there are no questions here. Can I just quickly ask, you said um, you look at a number of dynamic filters. Um, are they generic across all different scenes or scene dependent in terms of number of dynamic filters you need? Uh, no, we, are all, we always use the same number of dynamic filters on all the experiment, and we just set our architecture with a fixed number. So we do not adapt the number of filters based on the sentence, if that's your question. Right, if there's no more questions, let's thank Federico one more time. Thanks, thank you. Uh, before we continue, so can I just double check? The fifth speaker and uh, the paper entitled Push for Quantization Deep Fisher Hashing. Do you have any authors present here? Right, okay. Uh, we, we haven't found you yet, so you do need to prepare later. So, third speaker session will be Zhe Shui from City University of Hong Kong, and you'll be talking about the compact C and with banalization. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for coming to my presentation. I'm Zhe Xu from City University of Hong Kong. And today I will introduce our work titled Accurate and Compact Confusional Neural Networks with Trained Binarization. So uh, in this work, we propose several approaches to uh, in improve the binary confusional neural network accuracy performance. So first I will give a background about this problem and the proposed uh, training approach and uh, evaluation uh, results are provided. And finally, I will give the conclusions and the future work. So as we all know, the uh, confusional neural networks uh, have achieved significant uh, success in many computer vision uh, applications such as the image uh, classification, the object detection, the style transfer, and the visual relation uh, detection. However, the uh, uh, large network size and the high computational complexity of the CNN made the deployment on the uh, mobile or the edge computing devices quite difficult. As we can see in this table, the uh, complexity of large CNN is uh, up to gig operations for one image, and the model size is up to hundreds of megabytes. That's why the binary uh, CNN attracts the research interest in recent years. Uh, by quantizing both uh, weights and the activations with use, uh, using just one bit, uh, we can not only reduce the motor size by up to 32 times, uh, but also replace the compass uh, multiplication, uh, multiplication operations with uh, simple logical operations, and it is easy in hardware implementation. Uh, but uh, one drawback of the uh, binary network is that uh, it may decrease the uh, accuracy. That's why we want to uh, propose the approaches to train this binary network with higher accuracy. So uh, this is the overview of our uh, binary convolution layer. And in the forward pass, we uh, do the binarization of the weights and we import uh, scaling factors alpha to improve these, uh, improve the uh, representation ability. And we do the binary convolution with both one bit input and one bit weight we just uh, binarized. 
and uh, calculate the and follow with the batch normalization and the uh, activation to get uh, one bit activation at the uh, input of the next layer. So we can calculate the uh, total network loss and calculate the gradient uh, using the uh, estimator of the uh, binarization functions. Then we update the uh, in initial weights and the our scaling factors to finish uh, iteration of training. So uh, for binarization, normally we can use the uh, sine function or the uh, unit step function to do the binarization. But uh, the problem is that these functions uh, may uh, highly restrict the uh, outputs uh, with just a zero or one. So we set two trainable scaling factors, alpha and beta, for the weight and activations, uh, respectively. So the uh, binarization functions can be written in equation two and three, and these alpha and beta, they are trainable, so we will update, update them uh, during the network training along with other uh, network parameters. Here, uh, tau is a shift parameter in, in the uh, activation. And uh, another problem of the uh, binary network is that uh, um, it's hard to it's hard to change because the uh, in, in it's hard to change the backpropagation because uh, uh, binarization functions are non-differentiable. So uh, in previous works, they uh, employed uh, clip functions as a straight uh, through estimator, like uh, showing in Figure D, and uh, um, in instead uh, we proposed two kinds of. Uh, uh, estimators for weights and activations. For the weight, we use a high order estimator, which is a uh, piecewise polynomial functions uh, in equation five. So it's a tighter, uh, tighter approximation of the, of the uh, uh, binarization function. And uh, for the uh, derivative of our activations, we use a long tail form as uh, show illustrated in uh, fig F. And the reason uh, we use this long tailed uh, form is that it has a larger non zero activation, activation regions, so it can uh, give a smoother back propagation. And since in our approach, uh, the scaling factors alpha stands for the actual. Uh, filters for feature extraction. That's why the uh, regularization term should be modified accordingly, and uh, the uh, total loss is uh, can be written in equation seven. The L means the uh, original task related loss in the network, such as the cross entropy loss in image classification, and the second term uh, is the uh, rich regression uh, on our scaling factors. And uh, from these training curves, the uh, red curve is the uh, training curve with regularization, so it helps to train the network smoother and improve the network uh, accuracy uh, slightly. And uh, in our view, a good uh, quantized or binarized network should be easy for hardware implementation because uh, these kind of networks are specific for hardware, and uh, that is also the target of our design. Taking this three by three binary uh, convolution as the example, we can write the uh, convolution in equation eight. Here are two parts. One is the alpha beta, which is a product of two uh, uh, scaling factors. Another is the pure binary convolutions. Since the alpha beta the, it's a constant for an output channel, so we can put it in the following batch normalizations uh, together uh, and do the calculation. So we only concern the pure binary, binary convolution, and uh, uh, definitely we can use the logical, bitwise logical operations uh, written in, in nine. This in, in nine, the pop count means to uh, count the number of one in uh, binary string. So uh, the hardware structure shown in in this figure and, and 
uh, we can see uh, compared with the original conclusions, which needs uh, nine multiplications and eight additions, the binary uh, conclusion only needs two power count operations, one subtraction, and several logical uh, operations. So it highly uh, faster the uh, processing speed and uh, requires less uh, hardware sources. So uh, we evaluate the binary uh, CM performance on the image image classification tasks. Uh, first is on the Cypher 10 ta dataset. We use the VGG small uh, network, the same as other works for comparison. Uh, so we can see the uh, proposed approach achieves better uh, performance exceeding x net by 2.5%. And uh, it is very close to the uh, HWGQ, the reference three, which used two bit for uh, activation binarization, uh, activation quantization. And uh, from the training curves, uh, it uh, also uh, can be seen that uh, our approach is easier to convert. That means we can save the training time. And on the larger image net data set, uh, the approach improve the accuracy performance by up to 5% on the XNet and up to 10% on the ResNet 18 networks. And uh, we are also concerning the network size compression since it is one of the advantages of binary network. And ideally, the binary network should achieve 32 times compression ratios, but in practice, uh, we cannot binarize all layers. We leave first and last layers in full position for the accuracy issues. So the real uh, binary network reduce uh, the network model size by from 10 to 30 times. And uh, it also inspires a better uh, binary network design with uh, higher compression efficiency. So to conclude, uh, in this work, we proposed a binary CNN training approach with uh, several new approaches, such as the trainable scan factors, a tight gradient estimator, and a modification uh, and the, a modified regularization. And these approaches helps to improve the accuracy of binary CNN. And for the future work, we want to uh, extend our work for arbitrary uh, activation quantizations and uh, do more evaluations on different tasks such as the object detection and face recognition. So here are the uh, some references. Thank you. Questions for speaker? Do we have questions on, from one 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 four, please? Uh, no, we don't. Okay. Right. Yeah, sure, Very interesting talk and great results. So um, you leave the first and the final layers untouched. Yes. Full yes. precision. Uh, what's your judgment? Uh, could you at least go into some coarser quantization um, rather than float 32 bits? You know, is there a scope? to reduce the complexity of the first and final layers. Uh, you mean the approach to uh, reduce the complexity of the first and last layers? That's right. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, even the first and the last layer, they are not, in practice, they are not in a full position. They are like in 8 bits or 16 bits. And, uh, but uh, it cannot do the same uh, binarization as other layers. Otherwise, the uh, accuracy may drop. Uh, dramatically. So the question is what maybe we can't just binarize, but what would be the solution for the first and final layer? Would it be a different architecture? Or would we always be forced to use final precision? What's your view? Uh, actually, uh, we can explore different architectures, like diff uh, using a uh, branches in the first or the last layer to get more uh, representative abilities. And each branch maybe can use uh, one or two bits, uh, in extreme low bits. Thank you.
that uh, um, you said you use the hyperparameter alpha. Is that uh, doing on the filter or on the activation? Uh, we have two scaling factors, alpha and beta. Alpha is for the uh, weight binarization and beta is for the activation. So uh -huh. these two parameters are chained the same as uh, your, your weights and other parameters uh, via backpropagation. Yeah, so how it can combine with the batch norm alpha and uh, beta? The batch norm uh, also has a scaling or uh, shift uh, and uh, the scaling parameters, how can you combine with them? Oh, uh, since uh, in, in the training, the batch normalization stays unchanged, and uh, in the inference stage, we put these different uh, parameters together uh, to get a new parameter that reduces the complexity of the network. Since we can, con uh, we can calculate one times instead of two times into uh, different layers. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank uh, speak one more time. So our fourth speaker of the session will be Anke Hare from University of Texas from Arlington, and I think you're going to present uh, a talk on. Oh, okay. A contextual inference for creative captioning. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for being here. And I'm going to present my research on the topic, show, infer, and tell, contextual inference for creative captioning. This work is under the supervision of my supervising professor, Dr. Manfred Huber, at University of Texas at Arlington, as a part of my thesis. There have been a lot of papers in the area of image captioning on the same line of uh, naming convention, named as show and tell, and then further show, attend, and tell. I personally like this line of naming convention really well, and that's why I actually named my paper show, infer, and tell, which is like another work, recent one. So let's move ahead and discuss what I've done. Image captioning, as compared to object detection, is a more involved task because it requires understanding of the composition of the scene in terms of the objects in the scene. And then, further, it goes towards modeling the language in some human understandable language, maybe English or maybe Welsh, since you're in Cardiff. OK. And our architecture basically, in one liner, allows a tighter coupling between image level, image level features and word level features, because of which we can learn collocations. It, it, it can produce collocations and contextual inferences, which further leads to richer captions, which are more human-like. Existing attention approaches basically use a variety of things, such as multiple CNN and RN uh, that are being used in multiple passes, different like this, review net, and then additional attribute detectors, which basically use several approaches and additional training resources, additional data for further training. Uh, one of those approaches is this MOLAG. People also use several feature detectors using multi-label classification approaches. And then fairly recent, CAP V, which over and above the standard reinforcement learning language policy, also uses a visual policy. And our results, as you will see in the further slides, are actually pretty comparative and even better in Meteor and Cider D. And that too, without using these multiple layers of CNN and RNNs and multiple paths. Only one single model without ensemble averaging, without 
multiple passes of CNN and RNN can accomplish that in our case. Okay, before producing the overall architecture in front of you, I would like to motivate this a little and make you familiar with what the intuition was behind this research. In simple terms, research shows that as uh, we humans, when we look at an image, first we look at the overall content of the image, and then we move towards the further pieces of the image. My, this uh, paper also presents the same idea where the first channel uses the overall image, and then the second channel digs deeper into these spatial regions and then gets to see what's happening in there. Collocations and contextual inferences. So these are the words that I've been using quite often, like more than a couple of times in the previous slides, and that's what I plan to do in the future slides as well. So it's quite noteworthy and worthwhile to have a look at what they essentially means. Okay, so collocation in linguistic terms is just juxtaposition of a word in context of some other word or maybe a set of words. For example, these images that are from the Coco test set uh, are here to illustrate collocations and contextual inferences. These are a few of the collocations and contextual inferences that are produced by our model for these test images. Okay, one quick note here. When you see these images, a lot of things are not quite obvious, apparently, but as humans, it's quite natural for us to, to note that, to observe that. For example, when we see a person in the air and a skateboard near the person, we can quickly infer that perhaps he's doing a trick on the skateboard, right? But for a system, it might be a little different. So this is what we refer to as contextual, contextual inference in this uh, paper. And yeah, as I said, collocations and contextual inferences are what we observe in human annotated data sets, and that's what in our uh, system we have observed that our system is pretty good at, uh, at, at like uh, finally producing collocations and then managing to form contextual associations as well. Oh, one more thing that I would like to point out explicitly here. A lot of previous literature and image captioning, we have noted that hallucinations is a common problem. Hallucination of common contexts. Let's take an example. So this is a dog. It's like an out of context rare scenario where the dog is actually dining on a table rather than a human being. So a, a, nor, a, like a lot of existing image captioning attent, attent, attentive attention-based architectures basically would hallucinate a person in place of dog, maybe to uh, fit the language model, but in our case, it's not the case. In our case, the system is quite capable of not hallucinating the dog, and we'll see later how. Let's take another example, which is again a very rare scenario where there's an animal, cow, and another animal on top of it, a dog, and most of the image captioning architecture would either declare a dog or maybe a cow, but none of them I have seen has ever produced the contextual position of a dog in reference to a cow as well or vice versa. But in our architecture, we have managed to get a uh, captioning where both dog and cow with and each other's position is well described. And we have noted on numerous such examples before coming to this conclusion that our system is uh, quite good at not producing hallucinations. Now, let's try to understand what the overall approach looks like. So there, there's, there are two channels, channel one on the left in green, which basically uh, aligns all the words in context of the overall image, uh, overall image. And then we have a second channel in blue, which further aligns all those words coming from the first channel on the basis of the current context, that is, all the region of proposals that are being given by the region, of, by the region proposal network. And then further, it aligns all those words based on the sentence history, and then try to produce or learn inferences like traffic, street view, etc. <coughs> so now let's dig a bit deeper into the architectural construct of how our system, uh, how our system follows 
the architectural con what kind of con construct our system follows. So this is how the overall caching pipeline looks like. So here we have an RPN, a region proposal network, which is precisely a faster RCNN. It gives a lot of region proposals that are grounded in objects, and we use 100 of them, top 100. And then for the first layer, the first channel one, we mean pool them, and just one single feature vector is fed to the RNN, which finally aligns all those relevant word vectors. And then the channel two simultaneously operating on the other <coughs> side does what? Takes those 100 spatial feature vectors and then uh, tries to further uh, use all the sentence history with respect to each of those spatial vectors. And then using a multiplicative interaction, try to mix them in line and see whether the context makes sense and which, what kind of way needs to be performed in order for the context to make sense. Then finally, the language, the second LSTM, is fed. All, all those two uh, outputs from the two channels are fed to the LSTM, which does the language modeling, and then further refines the collocations and contextual inferences for a rich human-like caption. OK, there were, there's one more interesting thing here. That if, if you see those purple boxes, the word embeddings, WE1 and 2, so these are the two word embeddings in the two channels. And there's interesting semantics that is being formed in these two embeddings. Let's try to see what is happening in there. So this is how we have analyzed using k-nearest neighbors the eight words which are closest to the word shown in the leftmost sec column. So what we see, the green one is, belongs to the channel one, the embedding which was in channel one, the violet one. And then the blue one belongs to the second embedding in the channel two. And then we have noticed that channel one Embedding, word embedding learns prepositions, while the word embedding in the channel two tries to primarily learn uh, verbs and nouns. This is one of the interesting findings that we have tried to decipher. And then we have performed more evaluative studies extensively in order to see what all components of the architecture are responsible for the quality of caption. So we have seen that if in the second channel, all those spatial regions, instead of that, we only supply that mean pooled image vector, which is the mean of all those 100 spatial regions, then the scores are, looks like that. So the first one is the one that I'm talking about. The second one is our final model, and we can see significant increase in our final model as compared to this one where the spatial information due to those mean, po mean pooling is lost. And then we can expect that there's less level of detail in the caption and more hallucination because of the spatial information being less. Uh, lost. Then again, there's one more uh, ablative study where we compared that if instead of uh, RPN, we just randomly divide the grid into <coughs> equally spaced 10 cross 10, 100 boxes, then what happens? And we see the red scores. And then we have the qualitative improvements where we see how we get lesser, fewer hallucinations and more human-like captions. And uh, you can see in the, the last a, a blue block, how the captions are more detailed, more human-like, fine, refined. And then we have co quantitative results. We have used both Carpathy Split and the original test leaderboard, MS Coco. In Car on Carpathy Split, we uh, overperform, out, uh, I mean, bypass, surpass all those existing top-notch state-of-the-art models by a significant margin, all the metrics as shown in the table. And then on the test server, we have these results, which also uh, bypass all the uh, models in various metrics. But if you look at the cap V, which is fairly recent 2019 paper, you would look that on some blues and Ralph L, it has a, a slightly better performance, but we still surpass it on Meteor and Cider, even when our uh, network is like not using anything fancy, like a pre-training pre on visual genome data set or a visual reinforcement learning based policy or any other external resource for supervision or training. In conclusion, I would like to say that collocation and contextual inferences matter a lot for generating human like image captioning and in just one single pass without the overhead of training additional feature vectors or supervising the learning or training some uh, feature detectors using multi-label classification or any other such fancy approach or a visual policy in just one single pass without <coughs> such overheads, we have been able to get state-of-the-art results. 
and our future work will focus on analyzing uh, our model on learning-based metrics and some other uh, new data sets that have come into existence fairly recently. So that's all for today, fellows, and thanks for being patient with me and listening to all of it, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. Your questions are really welcome. <laughs> Can we just check? Do we have questions from room 104 as well? No, no we don't. For <laughs> okay. I was ready for you. <laughs> I, I think I'm using up my quota and will be asked to leave soon. Uh, OK, um, so it's very interesting. So when you talk about hallucinations, you, you want to, to avoid them because um, it creates a situation that there is some pre-assumption about what's happening in the scene. So like, for example, a dog may uh, indicate that it's not a breakfast scenario or a, or a table may indicate that dog should not be there. So we don't want this kind of pre-assumptions. But on the other hand, in your linguistic model, when you show the top neighbors, you have the same hallucination and bias there because for the cat, you have black. Uh, do you, can you show the slide with the top neighbors this one. So we have the word cut and the nearest neighbor is black and that suggests that there were a lot of black cuts in the data set and not many white cuts, right? So how are you going to get rid of this hallucination here? Okay, so well I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because it's gonna cr uh, clear a lot of a lot of the insightful things that I would want to discuss with you all. Okay, so first and foremost thing. Neural networks have been criticized a lot in uh, vision history for being black boxes. Like we don't know what is actually being uh, formed inside, like what kind of representations are being formed inside. So that's why there's a lot of literature and existing research that is being performed on making it sort of accessible that okay, these are the sort of uh, representations that are being learned, but still it's, I can safely say that it's just black box. So in an attempt to make sense of the interesting semantics inside the two word embeddings and the two channels that I've described, we have used k nearest neighbors in order to just see what is happening and what it might be learning, and this is what the findings are. But the system, okay, we have just taken eight words, right? And it tries to align uh, like a lot of such words, like there are thousands of words, nine, six, nine, six, four, eight is the actual vocabulary number that we have. So I'm just trying to say that it's not necessarily that when in a particular instance during a test image that has been given to us, it will, it will always choose black cat because it's actually, it all depends on the current visual context being presented to the, uh, to the system and how the system tackles with it. And it's not just the semantics that is being used, it's more than that. It's like the hidden representations and the hidden states of the two LSTMs that are being operated in the two channels that also contributes to this. So there's this entire mechanism that is responsible for the final uh, captioning output that is being generated, so that's why this is not the whole and sole criteria of determining whether that will be a black or white cat. So it wasn't a criticism. My, my question wasn't really a criticism of, of your method. I think it's very good you look inside. All I wanted to say is that there are, there are some priors um, uh, that basically uh, model our knowledge of a scene. And, and some of the priors are, I mean, they're both good and bad. Because they're good because they constrain you and they are bad because if you get something out of usual, they act against you. And this black cat might be an example of that. So I just wanted to you know, um, find out why there was no white cat. Is it the question of the database or? But you know, um, a very good point and very nice work, so thank you. Yeah, uh, one more thing since you have highlighted this. The thing is, um, yes, you're right. When we try to make a presumption, then there are some advantages and disadvantages to it. For example, when we see the second embedding in the green channel, here, what, uh, sorry, the blue second, second channel, what we see is all those 100 spatial feature vectors, they get to operate on all the words that have been generated so far. So there's like a lot of permutations and combinations that are being weighed, right? So it, the system gets, to chance, the gets, to, gets a chance to like see a lot of such visual context and then weigh all those words in reference to that. But what if there's some context missing in there, right? Then we would not be able to take into consideration. What if the data set doesn't have? Because such data sets have always some user bias that the human annotated data set, it automatically comes because humans have annotated and we have limitations too, right? So 
taking that into consideration, the system cannot be perfect either. But just, yeah, I, I agree that there are advantages and disadvantages to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. So we move on to Pen Ultimate's um, talk or session here. Um, it's on deeper fissure hashing. Can I ask the first the first also? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so it will be presented by Yuan Chung Li from, I think, Delft University. Is it? Yeah, okay. Right. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Yuan Chung Li from TU Delft. And uh, today I will present uh, our paper, Pushing for Quantization, Deep Fissure Hashing, collaborated with Wen Jiepei, Yu Fei Zha, and uh, Yang Fahermut. Uh, let's, uh, let me quickly have an intro about uh, image hashing. Uh, image hashing. In image hashing, the images are represented by the binary code. Mm, compare with the okay. compare with the traditional image retrieval, which use the uh, continuous features to represent uh, the image. Here, for the uh, image hashing, we use the binary code. There are two advantages for image hashing. The first one is it can speed up the calculation. The second one, it can uh, reduce the storage cost. Uh, okay, let's go to amazing deep learning. Yeah. Uh, we want to take advantage of the deep scene to generate the com compact uh, binary code. It's different from the binary neural network, which binary is the filter and the activation. Here we only focus on the last layer of the network, we want to generate the compact uh, binary code. Here is the normal architecture of uh, image hashing, deep hashing. You can see, take the VGG for an example. Uh, the output of VGG is uh, 4096. And here we add an add a FC layer to reduce the dimension to 12 and uh, then the sign function is used as the activation function to binary the uh, view to be binary code. <coughs> but there's a key challenge for this. Because the discrete uh, constraint uh, on the binary code uh, uh, have no continuous gradient uh, and uh, it cannot be directly optimized by the gradient descent method. Uh, you can see here, yeah. One of the solutions is to employ the SIG mode or tiny H to replace the non-smooth uh, sign function. Here you can see, yeah. But uh, for this method, there's a uh, drawback. It's very difficult to convert. Also, it it is. Uh, it has for the tiny h. Oh, it has the saturated area, so it has no gradient for the saturated area. And uh, another solution for the uh, challenge is that uh, we relax the binary to the continuous value and then add a quantization loss to optimize it, the binary code. Uh, you can see if it is optimized in a continuous space, it uh, can have the separable features in the continuous space. But if um, we take quantization, take the sign, what happened, give a large lambda. This quantization loss will have a wrong direction, will pull uh, different class together and uh, push uh, same uh, class far away. So what we expected is uh, to pull the same class together and uh, well push different class far away in the binary space. Uh, in our proposed method, we have two module 
uh, pairwise uh, similarity learning module and uh, contains the center learning module. For the pairwise similarity learning module, we uh, a margin is added to the uh, symmetric logistic loss here. For the same, same class pairs and for different class pairs, the margin is at uh, uh, the same margin. And uh, you can see in the right figures, if we increase the margin for the same class uh, pairs, it will be post similar. And uh, for the different class, it will be post uh, far away. And uh, another contains the center learning module. Uh, we introduce the uh, contains the center here, and uh, for the B I is the binary code for the I's image, and uh, C Y I is the center of this image, and uh, for this L intro, it want to minimize the Euclidean distance between the image and uh, its corresponding center. And uh, also we use the inter, L inter here. We maximize the distance between different uh, uh, class centers. And uh, okay, the whole framework, we combine the L pair, L intro, and the L inter. And there are two types of variables in the Framework: the discrete uh, variable b and c, and uh, the continuous variable u. Uh, we alternatively optimize them. First, optimize u with b and c fixed, and uh, because u is the output of the last layer of c, it can use the gradient descent method to backpropagate it, and. Uh, Second step, optimize C and uh, B with U fixed. Uh, okay, we fix B, update C, and then fix C, update B. Here we can get the B is uh, sin, B is equal to sin mu CY plus U. Here we define it as a feature binary code. Then we use this, learn the B to jointly optimize the U and uh, C. Let's uh, see a toy example on what happened uh, for the um, Fisher binary code. Here, it, if we define F as a transformation, here is a translation transformation of the original representation U. Uh, in the figure A, it's uh, the original U for two class, the red and the blue dot. Uh, you can see it's, uh, no, it's now separable in the binary space. And uh, if we, for the figure B, if we uh, learn C using the L intro here, it can pull same class together. And if we add both, it's also push different class far away. Note that the shape of U didn't change. It only do translate. Uh, so we do it. And uh, we evaluate uh, our method on three data sets, CFATN, Newswide, and uh, ImageNet 100. And uh, the first experiment, uh, we ev uh, evaluate the effect of our module. We based on the L pair without margin, and uh, then we add the other intro, it has 1.6% uh, improvement, and uh, if we add both, it has 4.2% uh, improvement. And uh, we also evaluate the functionality of different modules. Uh, here is the different modules. If we include all the modules, it performs best. We uh, compare with state of arts. Uh, our method uh, uh, perform have have the bound number for most uh, bits. Yeah. 
Thank you. So, uh, any question for speaker? Do you have a question from Lu Bong Fu as well? No? Um, I'll start with some questions. Sorry, How are we dealing I with have a question okay, go ahead. from the other room. Right, go ahead. Uh, so, very nice talk, and I would like to go to the beginning of your presentation. So, uh, you mentioned image retrieval, actually. Which slide? Uh, you mentioned hashing, hashing for image retrieval. So, my question is, ask, actually, uh, how much does this scale with the different number of classes that you have? Because we know that in uh, image retrieval, we usually have a very large number of classes. And the data sets that you have presented are usually like a very small number of classes. Uh, so what is the biggest, the, uh, the biggest data set that you have used? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, now we are trying on the three small data set, maybe for the image 100, it, it, uh, also is 100 class. But I think uh, this method can also be used on a larger data set, like the image night uh, 1000. But uh, I can see that the performance will uh, a little worse, uh, will be worse than the traditional image retrieval method because here we just use the binary code to uh, use as the feature. Uh, but uh, I think as the as our research doing yeah improved, and I think the method the hashing method can use the, to the larger data set. Yeah, thank you. Right, okay, if you don't have any questions, let's thank Yanchi one more time. <laughs> now we move on to the last talk of the session. Um, so it's on channel-wise recurrent neural network, and it's presented by George Bettison. From NTU. Hello everyone, my name is Giorgio Tsinas from NTUA, from Athens, and I will present you yet another uh, deep learning architecture. Uh, our main objective is to create uh, compact neural networks uh, capable of running on low resources devices. In order to have compact uh, networks, we usually need to optimize uh, some parameters like the number of uh, to minimize the number of parameters, the number of uh, floating point operators, operations, the memory footprint, and the parallelization. We want to increase parallelization. So, in this work, we mainly focus on uh, the number of parameters. Uh, while uh, recent architecture have million or even billion uh, number of parameters, uh, that uh, they are very high uh, redundant. So there are. Many solutions, uh, uh, like presented before, like bottleneck layers, distillation, pruning, uh, specification, and a uh, certain uh, weight alternative, which is uh, the case that we will uh, discuss. So, we will uh, we'll present a, a novel uh, layer, channel wise recurrent convolution layer, or in short, CRC. And we want to simulate uh, wide layers, which uh, have shown great performance in many tasks, and avoid the over redundancy of uh, the parameters. In order to do so, uh, we decided to formulate uh, this wide layer uh, as an, uh, a recurrent neural network, RNN, across the channel dimension. Uh, in order to do this, we have three simple steps. The first one is uh, to segment the input tensor into D subtensors across the channel dimension. The second one is to process the segments as a sequence, like a RNN approach. And the third one is to concatenate the output sequence into a fully new tensor. This is a simple formulation of RNN. 
So we have uh, the input segments xi, the output segments hi, the number of segments, and a class of nonlinearity, as in typical uh, RNNs. And also we have the cert weights, because <coughs> RNNs uh, have, use the same weights at each step. So according to this uh, formulation, this is the visualization. We can see that the it input tensor is uh, segmented into um, these segments, and uh, they are form uh, like a sequence, which is uh, uh, processed by an RNN. The final output is concatenated. Uh, as a result of the, this RNN formulation, we have uh, a reduction on the parameters, since they are shared be uh, between each step, and also, uh, contrary to the classical uh, uh, RNN, we have uh, the set weights are uh, three by three convolutional weights. So, uh, about complexity, the number of the parameters equals to the number of uh, the, param the, the number of the layer parameters equals to the number of the parameters of the set weight, uh, which is. Uh, reduce the uh, parameters by a factor of squared d, while the number of slopes are reduced by a factor of uh, uh, d because they are, it's very similar to a group convolution if you see the, the figure. So based on this kind of layer, we built an uh, architecture called RecNet. Uh, and uh, this layer, the CRC layer that we presented, usually results to very wide tensors, which uh, have to be reducted in order to have like, a useful network. Uh, therefore, each CRC layer is followed by a transition block, consisted by a one-by-one -one convolution, a batch normalization, and a relu nonlinearity. Uh, so, the CRC, along with the transition block, uh, comprise a building block, and we have this architecture with six such blocks. So, in fact, we like simulate six white layers. Uh, of course, the CRC uh, layer expands the the channels, and the uh, transition block combines the the channels and uh, shrinks the output. This is important because we have a high receptive field uh, because each step is a three by three convolution. So the last one has has a successive many three by three convolutions. So there is a small problem with this kind of logic because we have white layers. It's very good, has very representational power. But uh, we have high memory requirements for, uh, because the intermediate feature maps that they are created are very, very large. For example, uh, if we have uh, 20 segments of uh, 64 channels. We get uh, 1,280 channels, which is very problematic if we want to, to run this kind of uh, network on an uh, embedded device. So we... Uh, Combine the CRC along the transition block as one layer with a simple observation that uh, we can break the one by one convolution matrix of transition block into uh, uh, corresponding segments. So each output, output segment of the CRC layer can be processed uh, straightforwardly by a segmented uh, uh, part of the one by one convolutional uh, layer. This is the, the A matrix, which is uh, segmented into D, uh, D uh, sub matrices. Uh, this is uh, visualized on the right. So uh, the, the upper part is the point-wise convolution, the one-by-one -one convolution segmented into parts. Uh, we have to notice that uh, as I already said, the, this first part is a grouped convolution with the same parameter at each group, uh, parameter weight. 
And also, this is the problematic kind of part because uh, it it's, uh, cannot be parallelized. Even though we, we reduce the number of parameters by a large margin, we reduce flops, we reduce the memory footprint with the last trick of the uh, uh, segmented uh, convolution, we cannot, uh, uh, have, we cannot uh, uh, increase parallelization. Th this uh, is equivalent, uh, implementation-wise, is equivalent to applying this filter sequentially. And uh, this is a bit problematic uh, if we want to uh, use CUDA and uh, GPU advancements. So moving on to the experimental uh, results, we explore several uh, choices of the CRC layers. Uh, we used the standard uh, CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100 datasets. And first we explore the non-linearity uh, function. So uh, using a cert batch normalization weights, uh, we have very bad results. Uh, while uh, using uh, a simple uh, real nonlinearity is uh, almost equivalent to using no nonlinearity at all. However, using a, a separate batch, normal normal batch normalization uh, along with a real nonlinearity at each step, at each step of the segment, we have a great boost on, in performance and uh, a very good performance overall. This uh, increases the, the number of the parameters, but not like uh, significantly. There are very, very uh, few parameters at its batch normalization. Uh, also, we explore the kernel size of the shared weight. One important observation is that the, the first case, the first row and the second row, have very different receptive fields because WX. Uh, is performed on each segment one time, while W8 is sequentially performed and have uh, sequentially many uh, recep high receptive field. And finally, we can see the accuracy uh, error rate versus the number of uh, the parameters. Uh, we compared to several state-of-the-art architectures uh, of comparable size. As you can see, we have only up to 10 million parameters. And uh, we use the CIFAR 100 dataset because CIFAR 10 was too close to each other. Uh, the red line represents our networks. We have like a Pareto curve. And uh, we can observe that uh, we outperform the majority of the existing uh, architectures. Uh, moreover, you can see that we uh, have uh, very like uh, popular architectures in uh, our figure, like GoogleNet, MobileNet, DenseNet, or uh, WideResNet. Uh, we have to note that uh, only DenseNet has similar per performance, and uh, this is uh, like uh, interesting point because. Uh, DenseNet and RNet has very similar aspects and have the, the same drawback of, drawback of parallelization. Uh, however, we use third parameters and we hope that we have like a better performance than, than them. And we have different, different like architecture choices from them. However, they have the same Pareto curve. And this observation uh, give us a thought that maybe it's not about the, the architecture or, or trying to push a little. I have to, to lower my parameters like by one million and uh, lose some accuracy. But is, is that uh, like a credible solution? Because maybe you, have, you are on the same Pareto curve and you have like the same results if you just adjust the channels of your initial architecture. And uh, to be more precise, I tried very, very different tricks and uh, uh, bottleneck layers or whatever in order to even uh, push this architecture further. But I always uh, return to the same uh, curve, just adding more points 
in order to make it complete. That's all, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, do we have any questions uh, for speaker? Uh, great talk. Thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, from my point of view, uh, it's basically similar to group convolutions, but as you said, it's sequentially. So, because you're doing three by three convolutions, the receptive field expands each time because it depends on the previous one. Exactly. Right. So, it I think it makes sense to use this kind of approach in dense prediction tasks like uh, image segmentation, for example, where the output is um, an image of a similar size as the input. Uh, so, have you tried your method in um, this kind of uh, tasks, and would you think it will perform well? Uh, thank you for the question. No, I do not have tried on a different task uh, other than classification at the moment. Yeah, I would like to try it, and I'm. I probably. I believe that it will work well, like uh, similar to. To classification tasks, but uh, I have to try it. I cannot <laughs> say something for sure. Thank okay, second question. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, have you tried to use a transformer network uh, in order to have uh, par par parallelization instead of uh, um, recurrent layer? A transformer layer in what sense? Just uh, just to replace the recurrent one, like they did in uh, speech uh, processing. Yeah, but uh, if I'm not uh, like uh, mistaken, because I'm not very familiar with uh, tra transformer layers, uh, I'm not sure that I. Uh, it's the, the main point is to have shared parameters of the recurrent in order to have a small networks. I'm not sure with transformer if this is possible. Yeah. This is the main point of recurrent. I, I, to to be like. Uh, uh, truthful, I don't like recurrent that much, but I, 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 it's needed in order to have a few parameters. Right, before we take uh, one more question here, can I just ask room 104, do we have anybody have a question there? No, there are no questions. No, we take one final question. Um, hi, so when you do your uh, recurrent um, forward pass, uh, it seems that if I recall correctly, you take the output basically at each iteration, and you concatenate all of these outputs. Yeah. Um, what hap What would ha like? What would happen if you just take the final output instead, instead of like uh, only only one uh, like only the, the yeah, right most yeah it's it's right now with this kind of. Uh, Architecture, it's, it's not going to work. I, I try something like that. But uh, I, I do not have tried to push the, the, the expansion, the, the hidden layer uh, size to, to much uh, uh, length, you know, like, well, there are like 64 <laughs> per segment. If I go to 512, maybe working. I'm, I'm not sure. I have to try it. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of time, I think we, we should stop here and um, can carry on the discussion later on. Now, this concludes this first session. So I'd like to thank George and all the other speakers early on.